Meet Eric Smith, biochemist. He's at the Tokyo Institute of Technology and the Santa Fe Institute. He's kind of like a philosophical thermodynamicist biochemist. He's concerned with the origin of life. In fact, he wrote a book with Harold Morowitz called The Origin and Nature of Life. I talked to him in Tokyo about his new book and the origin of life. Let's hear what he has to say about Are We Alone? My name is Eric Smith. And Eric, are we alone? Um, some of us more than others. <laughs> right. So there, for you, I mean, we're alone in this room, right? But uh, when, I, when I ask the question, are we alone, uh, what does the we mean to you? I don't understand what people want from the question okay. in the sense that the biosphere is rich and interconnected, and the history of mankind seems to consist of stubbornly trying to create separations that don't actually exist to make ourselves more isolated within a biosphere where we actually aren't as isolated as people keep wanting to be. So I'm not sure I understand what people view themselves as a part of now and what they would consider it better or worse to view themselves as a part of if we knew something new. NASA talks about life, and they, I think they use Gerald Joyce's, Jerry Joyce's uh, definition of a Indeed. chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Yep. Now, tell me what you think of this, this word Darwinian evolution or a Darwinian threshold that Woz was talk, talk about. Is, is Darwinian capable of Darwinian evolution something that's black and white, so now you're not and now you are? Or do you see that as a cascade of selectivity? Or what? Tell me your yeah. idea on this. So this is one where I can give you an easier answer than many people will. <laughs> because, and it's not the answer most people use. Um, to me, Darwinian is a great word, and it should be used to refer to a relatively narrow set of processes. And so pan-Darwinism and you know, Darwinian selection of universes is not a direction I would go. The interesting thing is that the direction I would go says that we have a very hard problem that very few people talk about. You can get all kinds of kinetic competition that creates organized states in a disequilibrium system. You can get bulk chemical kinetics, you can get reaction diffusion kinetics. None of that I would call Darwinian. And a lot of it may be relevant to the origin of life and even to processes that maintain life. I would say the place, th there's no reason to extend the word Darwinian into that because we have lots of good words to refer to those already from non-equilibrium statistical mechanics and kinetics. So I would say let Darwinian stand for what it stands for. Darwinian is the competition and selection dynamic that occurs when some form of individuality has emerged so that collections of the individuals can make populations. But that's a loaded language. It sounds like woes a little bit. No, that's, no? let me come back. Okay. I don't read Carl that way. I don't read the Darwinian threshold that way at all. Hmm. And I'll, I'm happy to come back because I think it's interesting, and I think Carl's way of thinking about this is enormously important. And I still hew fairly closely to what I think his original intent was, even though there are a lot of people who want to distance from it at this time. But I'm, I'll say specifically what I mean. The important thing is, if Darwinian dynamics is predicated on the existence of individuals that form populations, we actually have to explain the emergence of individuality. In developmental biology, the emergence and the evolution of forms of individuality is understood as a science problem that is rich and hard. I haven't seen the sophistication of that thought about individuality percolate down into the origin of life community yet. Can you map your language of phase transitions onto the language of punctuated equilibrium of Gould and Eldridge? Probably, yes. That's a great question and an insightful question. I think, good. I don't know how far the following statement will generalize, but it was good for the hierarchy of matter. The phase transitions that occur in the hierarchy of matter occur in finitary systems. So for instance, a group like rotations in some number of dimensions can freeze out to a different group that is rotations but a fewer number of dimensions. And the thing that matters is the discrete count of the change in the dimensionality. 
If I ask how doing something like changing a temperature can relate to that change in the representation of a symmetry from one dimension to another, the change of temperature is a continuous thing. The change in a discrete quantity between three and two, or between eight and five, or something like that, has measure zero in any continuum. So as a result, the phase transitions, the rearrangements of structure, have no choice but to have measure zero relative to the continuous changes of parameters that we use to induce them. So this is why in phase diagrams there are sharp lines that bound continuous regions where the phase is the same. And this is one of the most important insights that comes from the renormalization group, Ken Wilson's um, 1974 physics report and papers associated with it. As you cool a system, it doesn't gradually become a little bit more ordered. It remains a liquid all the way until it suddenly is no longer a liquid and is a solid. And that discontinuity, mathematically it's a non-analytic dependence of the order parameter on the tuning parameter. That non-analyticity in large systems is the distinguishing characteristic of phase transitions, <coughs> as Wilson would put it. And what that is reflecting is precisely the fact that structural rearrangements only have a choice to be measure zero in continuum parameter spaces. I have often wondered how much of Gould and Eldridge's punctuated equilibrium comes from the fact that the structural rearrangements can only be finitary and the parameters that lead to them are in some parameters space continuous. It's interesting that you happen to be doing this MOOC at this time because we seem to see democracy in danger of falling apart around the world. And the immediate proximal cause of its falling apart seems to be the unleashing of resentment. So where democracy is falling apart, I don't see it. Let me say this very carefully. It's not wrong of people to say that they're trapped and that their circumstances are not fair or are frustrating. And to blame people whose circumstances are hard on them is not only not productive, it's not, it's not morally good. But at the same time, when people's actions don't build, when the actions are essentially just exercising resentment, you can't give them credit for that because that's not trying to fix something. We live in a world where that is starting to have legs and it could be really dangerous to a lot of us. And so in asking which scientific questions are urgent, we absolutely have to come to grips with the history of increasing frustration, hardship, and maybe lack of alternatives that seem to have unleashed this kind of tidal wave of resentment that we're starting to see washing around.